providing our community of lifelong learners, high school students, their parents from across Philadelphia metropolitan area, our students, our faculty and staff, opportunities to learn and to be engaged with new perspectives, to think critically about salient issues confronting society and engaging in civic dialogue. John Henry Newman, the 19th century's most important English-speaking Catholic theologian, spent the first half of his life as an Anglican and the second half as a Roman Catholic. I got half that equation right. I'm Episcopalian. Um, he was a priest, popular preacher, writer, and eminent theologian in both churches. Born in London and studying at Oxford's Trinity College, he was a tutor at Oriel College and for 17 years vicar of the University Church, St. Mary the Virgin. Newman was a prominent member of the Oxford movement which emphasized the church's debt to the church fathers and challenged any tendency to consider truth as completely subjective. In his work, The Idea of a University, building on his belief that ideas developed through lively dialogue, he wrote a defense of liberal education. In that work, he wrote, the university has this object and this mission, to contemplate neither moral impression nor mechanical production. It professes to exercise the mind, neither in art nor in duty. Its function is intellectual culture. Here it may leave its scholars, and it has done its work when it's as done as much as this. It educates the intellect to reason well in all matters, to reach out toward truth, and to grasp it. Our speaker tonight is Rich Lowry, editor-in-chief of the National Review. He writes for Politico and often appears on such public affairs programs as Meet the Press. He's a regular panelist on the KCRW <laughs> program, Left, Right, and Center. He's the author of Lincoln Unbound, The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United, and Free, and Legacy, Paying the Price for the Clinton Years, a New York Times bestseller. Lowry began his career as a research assistant for Charles Krothheimer, and in 1997 was selected by William F. Buckley to lead the National Review. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Lowry. Thank you, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My, my job is basically to boil it down. I'm a political pundit, which means I make erroneous predictions about political ephemera and hope everyone's gonna forget that I was wrong about whatever I, my latest prediction was about. I'm a situate myself politically. I'm a conservative Republican who happens not to like Donald Trump very much, which makes me a, a, a strange animal. These days, uh, my magazine, National Review, opposed him very strenuously in 2016 when he first ran for the Republican nomination. We said some harsh things about him. He called me a loser uh, repeatedly. I mean, it kind of brought back uh, memories, bad memories of high school. Uh, but we've, we, we occasionally, you know, we have a, a somewhat open line of communication, in part because when he became president, I was at a uh, dinner one night, and this uh, Republican, plugged-in Republican, was, uh, was telling us that Republican senators had realized that if they wanted to get in touch with Donald Trump, all you need to do is call the White House switchboard about anywhere between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. at night, because all Trump was doing was sitting in the residence watching Fox News. So he wasn't doing anything, he'd take your call. And I was like, you know, heck, I could do that. So, so one night shortly afterwards, when my wife had put the kids to bed, I was like, do you mind if I call President Trump? She's like, sure, but I, I don't want to talk to him. So I called the White House switchboard, 202-456-1414. And they're, I'm Rich Larry. I'd like to talk to President Trump. They're cold, please. I was like, holy, you're just going to put me through, <laughs> you know, the President of the United States? And then a, a nice lady picks up, and sure enough, she says, oh, you know, he's, he's very busy right now. Now, but uh, let me take your number, he'll, he'll get back to you. I was like, yeah, sure, sure he will. And then sure enough, the next day, the unknown caller uh, comes up on my phone, and it's, it's uh, uh, this, uh, another nice lady who says, are you Rich Larry? I was like, yes. Did you call President Trump last night? And I was you know, sort of thinking, yeah, but it's it just a joke, you know? <laughs> and then she puts on uh, Donald Trump, and I uh, explained, told this story to Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator from South Carolina, who's somewhat close to Trump. He's like, yeah, you know, President Trump is the most accessible person in in Washington, and Graham said when he wanted the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, to call him back and was having trouble getting him to call him back, he'd call Trump to call Pompeo to get Pompeo to call uh, Graham. So um, that's the way it goes. Uh, Joe Biden, though, does not, does not return my phone calls. I haven't tried it, but I don't think he would return my phone calls. But our politics is in a very weird place. I don't know if you caught the Super Bowl ad, second half of the game a couple weeks ago. It was um, 
uh, RFK Jr. using an old JFK ad, the format, to position himself as the young, youthful contender in the race, which he is, but he's also 70 years old. <laughs> and he's the youthful guy of the three main candidates, which um, is just an extraordinary thing. I'm a big baseball fan, I'm a big Yankees fan. And way back when, when people aged much quicker than they, than, they, than, than they do now. You know, 50 years ago, Casey Stingle, the legendary manager of the Yankees, was fired because um, he was too old. And his line afterwards was, the Yankees fired me because I turned 70 years old. I'll never make that mistake again. But we have uh, three candidates who have made that mistake uh, in, in their, their lives. So I'm going to talk about, uh, not politics, but I'm happy to talk about whatever you want in the Q&A, but talk a little bit about writing and what I think is the, the poisonous uh, attempt to uh, retrospectively edit some of the, the best writing in the English language and in our, in our civilization, and then maybe situated a little bit in the end of what I think is a broader threat uh, to Western civilization. So the key thing to know about writing uh, is it's hard. It's, it's really hard, even for people who are really good at it. Red Smith, the famous uh, uh, sports writer, I have it up here, says, writing is easy. Just sit in front of a typewriter, open up a vein, and bleed it out, drop by drop. There's a gentleman named Kyle Smith who wrote for my magazine for several years. He's now at the Wall Street Journal. He's a film critic. And his last piece he wrote for us about what it was like working at National Review, he described the act of, of writing. And I think just this captures it perfectly. And Kyle is an incredible writer. I, I'll, I'll, I'll never be as good as a writer as he is. Many people on our staff will never be as good as a writer as he is. And this is how he, he uh, described it. He says, someone pointed out uh, to him that my profile of Beto O'Rourke, a uh, Texas Democrat, was a lot of fun. And I had to disagree because I'd forgotten what I wrote. All I could remember was how I wrote it. The platoon-like jungle slog of inching ahead sentence by agonizing sentence, partly at the St. Agnes Library in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and then as the evening deadline loomed, moving over to the Barnes & Noble on Broadway and 86th Street so I could swill coffee as I wrote each syllable like doing a squat thrust. Kyle does not do many squat thrusts, uh, trust me. Structuring a joke is about as much fun as structuring a tax shelter. Now that I've, that I've forgotten what was in the piece, though, I can read it over. The three minutes worth of words that are left after nine hours of rubbing my forehead and staring into space and amuse myself. As a reader, I'm completely in tune with the writer's sense of humor. So this just all goes to how extremely hard writing is, how good writers literally sweat out every word they put on the page, and then desperately don't want an editor or anyone else to F it up. And it's easy to F it up. So speaking of effing it up, let's make sure I got, here we go. So let's take a famous passage from, from American history. We all know uh, from the Gettysburg Address, right? Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We all know, know those words, right? It's kind of wordy, right? You can make a few edits to this. Yeah, I, I, uh, I presume to do so myself. 87 years ago, the founders started a new country on the basis of liberty and equality. Is that, is that good editing? I mean, it's shorter. Maybe in some respects it's easier to understand. Why is it not as good? Anyone, anyone any, uh, any thoughts? Why is Lincoln better than, than as edited by Rich Lowry? Well, Lincoln's quote has some soul. Soul, mm-hmm. Any other thoughts? So that's, exactly the right word in a lot of respects, because it, it has a musicality and a profundity to it, right? And, and, and why is that? Well, it goes to what it draws on for almost every single, single phrase here. All go back to the King, King James Bible, which when, when Lincoln was around, you know, everyone had it on their bedstand, was like the book in American culture, and everyone knew it. And even now, when not all of us have a King James uh, Bible by our Ben Stan, we all know it. It has an, an echo, uh, um, these words have an echo for us because it has this deep grounding. Four score and seven comes from Psalms 90. The days of our years are three score years and ten. Brought forth uh, from Micah, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, a woman in travail. Conceive. It's a deep word, right? It goes to conception, birth, death, these most profound events 
uh, in, in life. Again, there's a, a biblical echo. And dedication goes to, how if you, you know, read the rest of, of the address, there's all, all this language that, again, has religious resonance, has soul, right? Dedicate, consecrate, hallow. And then there's the, this word proposition. Lincoln had a very, um, when he was a congressman, probably the only congressman who's ever done this in U.S. history, he's elected to Congress. The first thing he does is like, Oh, awesome. I have, I have access to the Library of Congress. I'm going to check out a book of Euclid, right? He loved thinking in axioms. He talked about the axioms of liberty. Same thing here, proposition, but it's a fraught word, right? Because a proposition is something that has to be proven. So you have all these layers of echoes from the Bible, from our deeper culture, and just meaning layered in there in every single word. So someone like me might come in and say, oh, I'm going to make it better. I'm going to make it more current. I'm going to make it less fussy and you lose all of that. And, and Lincoln was a supreme writer. I mean, uh, I'm gonna talk about Shakespeare a little bit uh, in, a, in a minute, but all he read basically is the Bible, Shakespeare, and some poems. And that's all you need to be a, a fantastically deep uh, writer yourself, if, if you have the, the right um, uh, talents on, on top of it. So th this goes to what, what I'm gonna discuss, the, the effort to go back and edit um, great works of literature. And, and this really, the, the first thing that, that uh, brought this to attention was the effort to edit the works of Raoul Dahl, a idiosyncratic, uh, weird man, but a hugely talented man who's written some of the most beloved um, children's books in our literature. They sold, um, you know, still, we're still counting here, but 300 million copies, um, which, which is, a, let me assure you, as someone who's published a couple books, that's a lot. You know, I used to joke, I worked for Charles Krauthammer, uh, the Washington Post columnist, for my first, first job out of college. And he had, he became a, a big TV star as a pundit. And he wrote a book that had a million copies. And I did an event with him um, uh, at, when his book was out. And I was like, Charles, this is so great for us. We're on the stage right now. We, we've sold a million and 10,000 copies of our books this year, right? But, but he contributed a million. I contributed 10,000. And to do 300 million is a lot now. But he's been deemed um, offensive. In some ways, he is. If you've seen the original Willy Wonka movie, he wrote Willy Wonka, it, he's highly offensive to strange orange people with, uh, with green hair. But um, what, what they've, um, Dahl's publisher has said is they're going to have sensitivity readers who are going to regularly review the language in Dahl to ensure that it can continue to be enjoyed by all today. Now, this is less sinister, but I think is in the spirit of you know, one of the, the, the most compelling depictions of a totalitarian uh, mindset in, in our literature, George Elwell's 1984, where Winston Smith, his job uh, to quote Orwell and the novel was to make sure that, quote, every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered, so that nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Now we're talk not talking about literally a, a party with a capital P, the way um, or Orwell is there in the you know, communist or a, a fascist party, but we're talking about a mindset that wants to constantly update things to make them, in its view, Correct, and I just think this is the, the wrong approach and the, the wrong way to think about our literature and our culture. Uh, this was, um, goes back to a less, less sinister version of this. The word boulderize, which means to kind of edit ham-fistedly, comes from uh, Thomas Boulder, sorry I'm leaping ahead there, who with the best of intentions in the 19th century said, I'm gonna edit Shakespeare, right? I'm gonna make Shakespeare in accord with our current sensibilities. And he published a volume of Shakespeare he cut about 10% out of Shakespeare. Uh, anything that was kind of violent or unsettling went out. You know, a lot of the point of Shakespeare is the stuff that's violent and unsettling. The suicide of Ophelia, for instance, was just made into a random, you know, fishing accident. Uh, uh, Boulder, by the way, said he just couldn't fix uh, Othello. And this used to be, you know, it, it was popular at the time. He sold a lot of copies of his editions. And then people went back and said, why are we doing this? This is crazy. And Boulderize became a word with very negative connotations. But that's what we're doing now. 
now. They're going after Ian Fleming, who wrote uh, The James Bond. Uh, they're going after Agatha Christie and her famous um, mysteries. They're going after uh, P.J. Woodhouse, who wrote a great uh, series featuring a, a butler named uh, Jeeves, who served uh, um, a clueless and ineffectual man who had attained um, stature for no good reason. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know how that got on, the, on there. They, they're they're uh, going after Marquis de Sade. Whoops, okay, sorry, that's the last one. I'm a conservative, you gotta, you gotta let me have my little partisan shots there. So the outfit that is um, editing the, the works of Raoul Dahl is called Inclusive Minds. They say they're passionate about inclusion, diversity, equality, and accessibility in children's literature. They're gonna use sensitivity readers and inclusion ambassadors to rid children's stories of allegedly offensive material drawn from marginalized, unrepresented, or misrepresented groups and background. And the woman who's kind of lead on this project describes herself as a non-binary, asexual, polyamorous relationship anarchist who is on the autism spectrum. Now these, these people might be very um, talented at what they do, but what they are talented at is DEI. Raul Dahl was talented at writing great children's books. And if any of the people with uh, this uh, in inclusive minds outfit were good at writing children's books, they'd write them. They wouldn't be editing someone else's uh, children's books. And the kind of thing they're, they're going after, I'll just give you a couple examples. This is from the book called The Witches. <clears throat> Dahl wrote, don't be foolish, my grandmother said, you can't go around pulling the hair of every lady you meet, even if she's wearing gloves, just you try and see what happens. I'm not sure the exact context of here here, but it's been changed. I, I'm not sure why. Don't be foolish, my grandmother said. There are plenty of other reasons why women might wear wigs, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Why? Why would you change that? The twits, Raul Dahl, Mrs. Twit, one of the characters, has a wonky nose and a crooked mouth and double chin and stick out teeth. Then it's been changed. Mrs. Twit has a wonky nose and crooked mouth and stick out teeth. So suddenly, for some reason, this uh, committee has decided uh, Mrs. Twit can no longer have a double chin. Why? She, this, this, this great uh, genius who's going to write better children's books than, than you know, anyone else probably in the next hundred years wanted to have a double chin. People do have double chins. What's wrong with having a double chin? But it is out. Um, so, if we're going to, what they're taking out, they say, is language related to weight, mental health, violence, gender, and race has been cut and rewritten. So if we're really going to go do this everywhere, we could take a passage from Moby Dick, a great novel by Herman Melville. The whale couldn't be white anymore. It's famously a white uh, whale. It'd have to be pale. Moby Dick, I don't think so. Moby, the marine mammal. You couldn't have awakened any, any man's feelings. It'd have to be women's, persons of any gender, so on and so forth. Homer, you couldn't have fat sheep. You couldn't have tawny headed, uh, uh, tawny -headed st stallions, or just stallions. It'd have to be mares. Man's would have to be persons, man's human beings, mother, birthing parent, so on and, 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 and on and on. So, so the point is this, is uh, th this effort is just inherently going to make great literature which is sharp, colorful, pointed, might make you uncomfortable, it's, it's going to make it worse, right? It's going to go to a lower common denominator sort of language, and if I can use this word, make it more um, vanilla. And that is not um, a good thing. And then there's just the matter, the basic integrity of the record. This is how the books were written. Right? This, this is how they existed and were meant to exist. So if you are going to go and change them, if there's really nothing different in principle than saying, you know what, Monet, that, that's the wrong shade of green and water lilies. We're, we're going to change it. We don't like that, that shade of green. There's something offensive we don't like about it. Or, you know, going to Tchaikovsky and say 1812 work, uh, overture, it should be in D sharp minor instead of E flat major. So I any effort on, along these lines with these kind of works would just be considered cultural vandalism. And I think it's the same thing uh, with works, uh, great works of literature. And this is part of just a, a broader disaffection um, with the classics and, um, and, and with uh, uh, amazing products of Western culture. The classics itself are under assault there from within the classics. You have uh, classicists now 
who maintain in the, the words of the New York Times that the classics have been instrumental in the invention of whiteness and its continued uh, domination. There is a, a quite a, a, a renowned classicist who himself has turned against his own uh, discipline, a guy I believe at Princeton named Daniel Padilla Peralta, and he says systemic racism is foundational to those institutions that incubate classics and classics as a field itself. Now Padilla, by the way, has an amazing story. He's from the Dominican Republic. He lived in a homeless shelter in New York City uh, for a while, and then he just discovered, discovered I think randomly discarded, a, uh, a book on ancient Greece and Rome, was utterly transfixed, fell in love with it, got, got to prep school, I think maybe with some, some help, and then went on to get degrees from Princeton, Oxford, and Stanford. So this is someone who is, is totally turned on to a new world and a way of thinking by the classics saying, no, they're, they're, there's something inherently wrong with them. As the Times says, uh, these, these, the school of classicism maintains that, quote, enlightenment thinkers created a hierarchy with Greece and Rome coded as white on top and everything else below. And I just think this is just total um, nonsense. I mean, the rigors of Greek and Latin, the timeless questions that are raised by Plato and Aristotle, the literally literary value of some of the most compelling poems, plays, and tracts ever written, the insights of early historians like Herodotus and Thucydides, the oratory of Pericles and Cicero, the awe-inspiring beauty of the architecture, sculpture, and pottery, 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 they're all available to anyone. They're not limited by race or ethnicity or national, nationality. That's part of the beauty of them. And the reason why they've um, uh, been such a, a subject of fascination and study for so long is they've made this vast cultural, political, and legal contribution um, to our civilization. The Greeks, obviously, they gave us the example. It was imperfect, but they gave us an example of democracy at work, and the Roman stamp is still discernible today on our legal system and institutions. And Western thought and literature have proceeded throughout uh, their history in dialogue uh, with these um, classics, constantly interacting uh, with, with the arguments, themes, and characters, and repurposing them in an interesting way, re repurposing them in ways that might be critical of uh, aspects of Western uh, culture. And that's another key legacy and was very unusual at the time, uh, and can still be unusual today. The West was able to critique itself. Right? You had Greek playwrights writing satires of their own society, their own leaders during times of war, you know, which are obviously throughout human history are a time of, of repression and a tendency to, uh, to stop any uh, dissent and you know, even jail and, and kill dissidents. So this is a, just a key part of who we are. And to throw it aside is a, is a great act of um, civilizational disregard. Another thing that is under um, uh, threat is um, uh, the, the, the idea of Anglo-Saxons. Um, Cambridge University now doesn't want to teach about Anglo-Saxons because they, they think it's a, that whole thing is constructed and contingent, that whole label. In 2019, the International Society of Anglo-Saxon Saxonists renamed itself the International Society for the Study of Early Medieval um, England. And this is, again, just for me, just totally uh, nonsensical. Right After the Romans left and they could no longer hold Britain when the Western Empire was falling apart in the 5th century and the Empire, Emperor Honorius writes this famous letter to the British, you're on your own, you know, good luck. They, uh, Britain undergoes a series of invasions from uh, Northern uh, Europe and Scandinavia involving initially the, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. This is just a historical uh, fact. The term was in use, Anglo-Saxons, by the 8th century. King Alfred the Great, I think that's him right there looking very uh, heroic, called himself the King of the Anglo-Saxons. So why are we afraid of this term? The name England means land of the Angles. The Anglo-Saxons gave us the language um, that, that uh, we, we use, which derived from Old English or, or Anglo-Saxon. They unified England as we know it and gave us uh, English Christianity. So these are enormous contributions, and for reasons of uh, contemporary politics, we don't, want to, uh, we don't want to hear about it. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, there is Shakespeare 
uh, himself. There was a book recently uh, written called White People and Shakespeare that accuses a playwright of engaging in white people making, whatever that is, and saying it's unsurprising, quote, that the fact of Shakespeare's global represent, 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 representational power existing almost in tandem with a global white cultural supremacy, indeed, it only renders, quote, more unremarkable or invisible a unique alliance of white people in Shakespeare. And again, you are taking this figure who uh, his work is incredibly complex. It's incredibly fecund. It's, it's uh, impossible to exaggerate his contribution, among other things, just to the English language itself. You know, he gave us words from accommodation to obscene. He gave us phrases including a Greek to me, budge an inch, more sinned against than sinning, and on and on and on. And a part of the case against Shakespeare is that he... Um, uh, uses the, the word fair a lot, which can be an, another way to say, you know, white or pale, but that's, that's not, sometimes it's the context in, in Shakespeare, but very often uh, it's not. And Macbeth, he writes about so foul and fair a day I have not seen. You know, that means sunny. And Trellis and Cressida, set during the Trojan War, Aeneas gets fair leave to bring a fair message to the Greeks while the fate of the Trojan depends on the fair worth of Hector. You have to be insane to say that that has anything to do with race, um, that passage. And in fact, Shakespeare rejected standard notions of beauty at the time, which were, you know, it was all about blonde hair, pale skin, long neck, obviously very uh, limited. And he wrote what are so-called the dark lady sonnets about his love uh, for a woman that didn't have any of those attributes. So to, to have this reductive, simplistic view of Shakespeare, again, I think is, is wrong um, and, and simple mind and is cutting ourselves off from something that's, that's very deep uh, and rich. So I, I think this, this effort internally um, is, uh, would be disturbing at any time, but I think it's, it comes in the context of a external threat to our civilization at a time when we should have confidence in the contributions of our own civilization coming from Russia and China, Russia and China, they represent geopolitical threats, they re represent I ideological um, challenges, political challenges, but I think there's also a deeper cultural and civilizational aspect to their, their challenge to the West. These are, these are uh, two non-Western societies. You know, Russia is a little bit a tweener, kind of in between, it faces West at times, faces East uh, at others, but both feel a great sense of resentment at the West. They think it's unfair that the, the West uh, achieves such uh, primacy uh, in the world, and they want to um, uh, topple and, and undo our uh, achievements. And if you look at kind of the sweep of history, um, the West has been ahead in socioeconomic development um, um, uh, ahead of the East for, for a very long time. Almost, uh, you know, th these measurements can be a little um, shaky, but uh, if, you, if you look, and this is a little hard to see, <laughs> this is a graph. You know, a couple millennia ago, the Western core, which was then Egypt and Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia which we not, would not recognize as Western societies now. There are no Bill of Rights. You can get a decent cappuccino uh, the way you can across the street here at the, at the Starbucks. But they were centered around the Mediterranean, which was the center of, of Western civilization. And these, these were societies that had a big lead uh, on the East for about 13,000 years, a very long time. Then you had this uh, collapse and um, uh, 1200, uh, 1000 BC or so, of state failure, catastrophic uh, migration, disease, and then the, the, the East catches up uh, somewhat, and then you have uh, Rome, which uh, le leaps, leaps ahead uh, in, in, here, in here somewhere, and then you have the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in, in the fifth century, which Rome had to collapse it, for the rest of Western civilization to happen, and Europe as we know it has happened. Rome had to collapse, but it was a very bad thing when it, when it actually collapsed. It, it was a, a massive uh, economic um, destruction, act of economic destruction and socio-political uh, dislocation, and the East goes ahead. So you, you look at China for, for a, um, quite a long time, they were way ahead of the West. They had contempt for the West. They looked at Northern Europe justifiably, correctly, as this totally backwards uh, era, era. The, the Chinese had better ships. They were doing more exploration. They had more productive agriculture. They had more industrialization. They had better 
mechanics, including clocks. They, had, they invented the printing press, by the way. You know, we, we didn't, not first. And Beijing was a much better, bigger, and more sophisticated city than London. And then kind of in historical terms, like a, in the blink of an eye, uh, China turns inward. You know, they burn their ships. Um, Europe, you have this, in, in some ways, very um, destructive state competition. There's constant warfare, but that creates a pressure. How do you create better armies? How do you create better technology? How do you create better finances that, that uh, creates better uh, practices uh, in, in the West, governmental and economic? You have an industrial revolu revolution, a scientific revolution. And then before you know it, the West, Western countries can send, and this is not um, you know, a great episode in our history, a couple gun show ships to China and bring the entire society to its knees. And they feel humiliated by us because we did um, humiliate them. But um, if, if we just take a step back here, the last time there was a big transfer of world leadership from one country to another, it was from the British to us. And this was an amazingly peaceful, arguably the only peaceful tra such transfer uh, in history. And it's because we share so much with the British. We come from uh, the British, ultimately. Same language, same values, same basic mindset, same uh, enemies. You know, there, there really hasn't been, haven't been many hostile acts between our two countries um, since the, the war of um, 1812. Although we did send them uh, Meghan Markle. But uh, in, in, their, in their wisdom, they, they sent her back. Um, but if, if we lose out to the Chinese is not going to be a peaceful transfer, and it's not going to be, um, they're not just going to leave us alone. They, they will seek to humiliate and dominate us the way they feel we humiliated and dominated them. So this is all to go, go to the point that, um, you know, I think this is, this is an amazing country. We have great resiliency, great strengths. Uh, we need to uh, believe in ourselves and, and muster those strengths. And going back to Lincoln and another passage that uh, can't be improved on uh, by a poor editor like like me, there's a famous speech he gave called the Lyceum Address. Before he was known, he was just an unknown lawyer and politician uh, then. And it, he said even then, you know, in the early 19th century, this country is so big and so strong, they could take the biggest army in the world and put the greatest general ever known, Napoleon, at the head of that army, and that army could not take a step on the Blue Ridge Mountains or a drink from the Potomac River by force of arms. Then he went on to say, if, dis um, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher as a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And I submit to everyone uh, tonight that we resolve to live. Thank you very much. So we do have time reserved for question and answer. Um, I can either moderate or you can feel free to do so. Happy to do it. Okay, perfect. Any questions from the audience? So yes, this week, um, seen several people <coughs> use Google. Yeah. What? With their AI. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I'm not a huge tech guy. I have not followed the story as closely as some of my colleagues have. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> it's incumbent on such a, a, a big company who aspires to have this AI used the way Google does, it is, which is by everyone, to play it straight. You know, and not um, uh, not embed biases within their technology or their rules. But this will be a constant struggle, and I, and I see this in, in journalism all the time. You know, I have wonderful colleagues in in the you know the mainstream or the legacy press or whatever you call it who thinks they think they're fair, right? And they're actually trying to be fair, but they exist in a in a, in a pool in a little universe where no one they never hear the the opposing view, really, or they never consider it. So they think they're being fair, um, uh, but they're not, because they, they're not aware of their own biases. And I think that's, that you know, may, may be at work here, too. Certainly has been at work um, in, in, at, in Silicon Valley with, with regard to other issues and technologies. Well, it seems that they pander to the few and offend the many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, th this, we'll see what comes of it, but it looks as though they've... Um, they realize this is a mistake, and they're, they're going back and reconsidering. Google, again, I'm not a tech guy, but one of my colleagues who is, just thinks, it's be, thinks Google's just become a, a lazy 
company. It's, just, it's also just not a good product. And, and even the Google searches now, I just don't find as y useful. I don't know whether I've, I've become dumber and become, uh, harder for me to figure stuff out, but it's just harder to search stuff and actually find it. And he compares my colleague Google to Microsoft, which um, you know, tech geeks 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, like, it's, it's, it's terrible. You know, Microsoft, the, the, you know, the, their desktops, and Microsoft Word, and Apple is so, so much better. But Microsoft just had inherited this kind of, kind of dominant position. And that's one of the advantages of our system and our economy was working correctly. You become lazy, and eventually someone else finds a better way, and you, and you fall back. And maybe this is the beginning of the process of that happening to Google. Yep. Is, are they being lazy and are they trying to be fair or are they trying to rewrite history? The way we're talking about tonight. Yeah, I think it's probably, it's a little of both, but um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a little of both. You know, and obviously the latter is, is, is uh, more, more sinister and, and more, more to be concerned about. Um, so speaking of history, um, you reference the time <coughs> at which the West was able to critique itself. And um, you said it was very important that we recall this because there are times like during Civil War yeah. where dissent is, um, it's illegal to so yeah. publish dissent. And I guess my thing is with these people that are uh, creating edited versions of the classics, the classics are still very easily accessible mm -hmm. and the edited versions tend to only be read by like very niche small communities. I just don't understand how this is different than traditional dissent. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree with what they're saying, but the only people reading stuff like the edited classics really are just niche micro communities. Yeah, I think that's a fair that's a fair point, a fair rejoinder. Um, I, I would say, like with with Dahl, it's the publisher of Dahl's books, and it's true there. You know, the three hundred million copies might all not uh, be in existence now, but they're the ones that are in libraries. They're the ones that tend to be in, on bookshelves. But the ambition here is, you know, as those are thrown away or become too ragged to read, these will become the the copies that that are read. So um, I think that that am ambition is um, a very un Worthy and, and the whole. I just find that the, the whole effort. Even if you're, you know, again, you're James Bond. Most people are going to find a James Bond that's the old James Bond. Trying to create a name, new James Bond is inherently a noxious um, enterprise. And I and I would draw a distinction. Again, I, I think there's there's a lot to what you say, and it's a, it's a great point. Um, between there's there's one thing to dissent and critique. So it's it's one thing to. Um, uh, critique Raoul Dahl. And there's lots of things that he can be critiqued on. You know, I kind of poked fun at the Oompa Loompas, but the, the Oompa Loompas are not a great, they're not a great depiction in, in, in the book. He, he had uh, anti-Semitic attitudes at, at least. So it's one thing to write an article saying Raoul Dahl is, is bad news, wrong on things, but I think it's another thing and it crosses a line to go and, and actually physically rewrite it in, in uh, in league with the publisher of his books. That, in, in my view, the publisher should be considering this a sacred trust. Someone comes and says, "We're going to change the, this words, these words and phrases." Like, no, what are you doing? This, this is this is you know we're here to protect uh, this work. So, but I, I think you you make a, a good point. But that'd be my my reply. But it's a state yeah. that's doing it, and they're doing it to keep some books. Same is true for Agatha Christie. Same is true for Ian Fleming, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just about making money. It's not a, a big cultural stand. They want to sell books as time, the times change. So, yeah, it's, so it's, it's not some great sort of cultural project. It's, it's, it's well, I mean, it's, um, again, I think this is a fair, this is a fair point. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're, they're doing it because they want to cater to the culture, and it's not—it's not a coincidence. When something happens like multiple times, it's not a, a coincidence. And even if they're doing it, and I, I think a, a mistaken belief that this is, you know, going to make these things more marketable or they're going to sell more—that doesn't mean, you know, people do lots of things to make money that are are bad and wrong and, and shouldn't be done. So I think they're written the way they're written for a reason, and um, people. Are not so fragile uh, that they can't 
deal with a double chin, right? Why? So why are they, they taking it out? So I do, I do think it's an, act of, um, it's an act that reflects the culture, and it, and it is an, an act of, of vandalism against a, a work of literature. It'd be one thing if Dahl were still here and said, you know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll edit it, you know, I'll change it. Fine, he, he's the author, it's his. Um, but these, but they're, they're, it's not, um, they're not doing it with his uh, consent. You know, Wordsworth, right, leaves of grass, he never stopped writing, you know? That's fine, I wouldn't complain about that. But if someone now is gonna go back and say, you know, well, these, they're kind of these sexualized references in leaves of grass, which there are, and we gotta take them out because they're offensive, that's, that's a, I think that's a, a violation of, um, of a kind of, of, of trust and, and a offense against his, his memory and his work. Thanks for thanks for coming to to the cell. I I, um, I see a much larger threat with um, with state sanctioned attempts to ban books. Right. Mm -hmm. So we we have the American Library Association uh, <coughs> shouting alarms from the rooftop. Right. Regarding regarding censorship, um, we know so much of what's happening in so many of the of the red states in particular, right, restricting, restricting access to, to material. Uh, so I'm curious, I'm curious how, you, how you see that threat. Yeah, so I think it, it depends on um, what, what, you're, what you're taking out of libraries and, and why. So it's not, you know, the, these books aren't um, being destroyed or you can't buy them anywhere in Florida. They're, not going to be available in a school library if, it's, if they're deemed inappropriate. Now, we've all seen the stories about some books that are deemed inappropriate that it's obviously ridiculous and it's wrong and they belong on the shelf. There's one, and I hesitate to mention some of these because you've got to kind of follow the thread and find out how they really turn out. Um, but there's a biography of Jackie, Jackie Robinson, right? And there, there's no way, <laughs> you know, I don't care how old, you know, young the kid is, we're reading about Jackie Robinson is not totally appropriate. I think this might be something that was pulled and then when they actually reviewed it, they put it back uh, on the shelves. But there have been, there, there have been uh, books that, that sh shouldn't be taken off the shelves. But there are books in libraries where, I mean, this is a real phenomenon, Ron Sands would talk about this a lot, where you have a school board meeting and a parent would get up and say, Here, here's this passage in this book available to my sixth grader or fourth grader, whatever it is, let me read. And the school board's, please don't. <laughs> we, we don't. We don't read that. You know, we don't want to hear it in a meeting. It's not appropriate in a public meeting with adults. So that's a, a book that it shouldn't be banned. You know, it shouldn't be burned, but uh, probably shouldn't be um, in in a in a library, in a school library for young kids. Why don't the parents control that? Pardon? Why, why should we take the books off the shelf? Let the parent control their kid for one. Well, I mean, the, the, the issue is, first of all, it's, this, this is framed as a, as a way, I think largely correctly, to give parents more say, because as the parents complain and then, then the, the school uh, reviews it, whereas they, there wasn't this ability for parents to uh, blow the whistle uh, like this. And two, I think the issue is that, um, yeah, you can, if, if a kid is bringing the, the book home, you can just say, you know, I have kids, we, we do this. Um, no, uh, sorry, you're, you're not reading that. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm taking that away. It's, it's not right uh, for you at this moment for whatever uh, reason. And you have to do that constantly. You do it with computers, you do it with, with TV. But I think the issue is that the, the, at a school, a child can go in, open this book that has this um, content that you as a parent would not want the, the child to have access to because you think it's inappropriate at that age. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's happening in, in, a, uh, in, in a space where you're, you're not there and you can't, can't monitor um, the, the intake. Well, I would say there's always been books that I suppose you can call questionable. Um, there was like a book by the author Beverly Cleary. I remember I was speaking with my mom about it. Um, that came out when she was in middle school or high school that had a lot of explicit content. Mm -hmm. That was never taken out of her schools and her generation ended up being fine. Flowers in the Attic, that's another classic that has a lot of explicit content that has been available in schools this whole time. And, you know, Gen X is you know, permanently disturbed because of it. Your issue with this is you take issue with the censorship, but you also have to consider <coughs> like the other kinds of censorship and what is more of a real threat. One individual's author, one individual author's publisher or like a wider war against just literature. 
Yeah, so I, I, I kind of address this. I would just take issue with the characterizing it as a war of um, literature. And you're correct, you know, like having a book that has offensive material in the library is not going to mean a whole generation, you know, uh, uh, collapses into to lurid um, behavior. But I think a parent saying, I, I don't want my six year old to see this, that should be taken. Um, seriously, and again, you're not. Uh, if someone said um, parents don't want their six-year-olds to see this book, that's actually was meant to be at a higher level, but for some reason is in their their library for their their six-year-old. And what we're going to do, therefore, is change the go back and edit edit this all out and not, never publish this passage in this book the way the author intended it to be there. I would say no, that's completely wrong. The answer would be if a parent's concerned about a young child seeing the material that seems to be inappropriate, just take it out of the school library, you know. And when they're, when they're uh, in junior high, again, hypothetically, maybe the book should be in that library. You know, it's still going to be available in bookstores, it's still going to be available on, in Amazon. So I don't think this is, um, to me, that, that is not, um, that's not censorship on the book is still widely available. It's not just not available in one place where children that you believe shouldn't see the material uh, are going to see it. But isn't this uh, affecting not only uh, primary schools, but also also high schools and now universities too, right? Uh, particularly, particularly with respect to Florida, right? And, and how history is taught, right? And academic freedom is being restricted. Um, I, I see that as a as a major threat to to um, one of the very pillars of of Western civilization, as you would as you would as you would describe it, right? The, the yeah. Of thought, right? Yeah. So I think there are um, there 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 are aspects to what DeSantis is is doing or trying to do with higher ed that do have First Amendment implications and and free speech issues. But I think in in uh, in that area, at the end of the day. Public schools and public universities, they're public. They're, they're government institutions. So someone decides what the curricula is, when it's going to be taught, how it's going to be taught. That's always decided by public authorities. And what DeSantis has, has done, by and large, is he's moved the needle in a direction that he thinks is, um, uh, is, is better for education and for, for these kids Ultimately, now there may be another governor who has other school officials, and will will move the needle again. But it wasn't as though this was the, the curricula in Florida has existed was just you know organically created and and you know uh, uh, um, you know Athena out of the head of Zeus and just appeared. Government officials decided it was going to be a certain way. And the thing that I am and ties into my remarks most directly that I'm most encouraged by what DeSantis is doing in Florida is we should teach Western Civ. It should be a requirement, right? Because uh, these works are so great. It's such an inherent part of our, our culture. Even if you're much more critical of our culture and civilization than I am, you should know this stuff. This should be a foundation for you. It'll enable you, to, in some respects, to be more effective in your criticism of our culture and our civilization. And it used to be, you know, 30 years ago, this was just a, a foundation, almost in every college and university. And then without anyone deciding, without anyone taking, not, without anyone deciding democratically, without anyone taking a vote, it just disappeared. And um, I think it's, it's totally appropriate for a public official to say, no, in our public universities, private universities can do whatever they want. This is just going to be, you know, your first two years, you're going to take Western Civ one and Western Civ two. And that's, that's not, uh, um, uh, that, that's not inappropriate or, or coercive, in my view, in, in any way. Now, if you said private schools have to do it, that's another matter. So I, I think we have time for two more questions. And I'm going to ask the first, which is. Um, he, he, just, he just cut the questions in half. Did you notice that? <laughs> right, have you been in politics? Are you going to go into politics? <laughs> so, so, as, as a proud uh, UVA alum, can you contextualize the Jefferson Bible within this rewriting tradition? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, well, so I went to the University of Virginia, which they, some people still call Mr. Jefferson's University. <clears throat> um, he found it as one of the most, uh, the things he treasured most in his uh, life. Uh, I think it is um, his tombstone. He, he asked to be identified as uh, governor of Virginia, author of the Declaration of Independence, and founder of the University of Virginia. And a sign that things you know, haven't changed that much on, on college campuses. There was one famous incident where uh, UVA students, they, they uh, got madly drunk and like rioted on campus. And he was literally weeping, like weeping over this, that this, his treasured uh, uh, idyllic uh, 
institution of higher education had been brought so low. But I, I'm kind of a self-loathing um, Jeffersonian. I, I'm a Hamiltonian. Uh, much more, I think Hamilton was right on all, all the big stuff. And, and, and Jefferson you know, created a, a Bible where I, I guess he, he cut out all the Jesus quotes, basically. <laughs> Anything I'm talking about here, Jefferson had it. Uh, uh, went, went much further, but you know, it was for his private use, you know, and that's, again, you, you want to slice up Raoul Dahl, or not read Raoul Dahl, or not have your kids read Raoul Dahl, Dahl fine. It's just, I, I think, go, going back and changing it after the fact um, is, is, is wrong. Yes, sir? Um, regarding the debate over what should be censored and what shouldn't be censored, um, just to provide a little platform, I'll make a little bit of a statement. I think it's like, um, it largely depends on what is and what, what, what it is that is being censored. For example, if we're going to talk about Roe and Dahl, um, the Ubalupas, my personal opinion is that they're not offensive because they're a fictional representation of showing that people in the world are different. And that's really all it is at face value. It's not taking a stance on if it's good or bad. Um, and um, I think that something like that is just kind of describing what is and what isn't in terms of like um, stating somebody has a double chin. It's not really taking a stance. It's just describing as is. So I, I would say something like that shouldn't be censored. But then we also have examples in our education system specifically. Um, from college down to elementary, where there are changes in literature to, um, the word indoctrinate is used a lot. I don't know if I would like to use that word, but I can't think of a better one. Um, to kind of inject certain information into the minds of children in terms of what is and what isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, usually this practice, I would say, is um, on the topic of opinions rather than fact. Um, so my question to you is kind of, in terms of education specifically, and not so much literature and children's books, but more so just present topics that we talk about now in politics, um, where do you see um, freedom of speech being abused or not abused in the present day? Well, those are excellent um, and very thoughtful comments. You know, I, I think that there, there are such things as, as facts. Um, and it's not indoctrinating to, to teach people the facts about history or math or, or, or whatever it is. But then there should always also be an aspect of critical thinking, right? To be able to, to challenge uh, someone else's opinion, have your opinion challenged, and, and not, you know, uh, be reduced to a puddle of goo and make an argument and try to be persuasive, whatever your point of view is, you know, whether you're a Marxist, an anarchist, a, a, a Trumpist, a conservative, liberal, whatever, being able to defend your view is, is crucial. And I think the most disturbing um, aspect of uh, where we are in free speech is, is on, on many college campuses where people don't want to hear speakers who disagree with them and uh, consider it a physical threat. And th that's a, that, that's a, a, a deeply uh, illiberal um, attitude that it, it speaks of totalitarian is, is, is too strong, but not even wanting to hear is, is, is really, um, uh, it's, it's so inimical to the whole idea of, of higher education. You should want to hear dissenting views because for many reasons, you know, and Jefferson was very powerful on this. He was a huge advocate of free speech, obviously. Your views are sharpened. You know, there, there might be, and I'm pretty dead set in, in most of my views, but occasionally I change my mind, you know, and it's because I hear something I disagree with. It's crazy, that's wrong. Wait a minute. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's not quite so crazy. And then before you know it, you're, you're, you're down the road to, okay, maybe that point of view is right. But you never, if you never considered a, 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 an opposing point of view, that's never gonna happen. And then, but most of the time what happens is you hear that point of view and you disagree with it. And you're like, how do I, how do I rebut that point of view, right? What's the best argument against that point of view? So your arguments get sharper and hopefully closer to the truth. Like, you've made excellent points tonight. You know, I'm going to go away in the car ride. Uh, you know, 
Maybe I'll end up, who knows, maybe uh, you know, a couple months from now, I'll end up agreeing with you. I probably won't, but I'll think about it. And, and I'll, I'll, next time I give this talk, I'll say, well, maybe someone's going to bring up that same point. Maybe I should uh, think ahead about what I'm going to say. Right? So that's how, that's how an exchange uh, happens. And, and I think in some, not all, but in uh, some college campuses, that's considered threatening. That's considered wrong. And that exchange is being cut off. And it, it's bad for everyone. It's bad for both sides. It's bad, bad whether you're in uh, the left or, or the right or in the middle. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, please join me. In Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And really, the, the questions and the comments were, were excellent. And I really appreciate it. Good luck.